to all our audience. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all uh, for coming to today's talk. Um, today's talk is organized by the Department of Chinese Studies in collaboration with the China Studies Center Language, Literature, Culture and Education Cluster and the Australian Society for Asian Humanities. Um, we would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owner of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Yora Nation. It is upon their ancestral lands that the University of Sydney is built. As we share our own knowledge, teaching, learning and research practices within this country, may we also pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. Um, now, um, allow me some time to introduce today's speaker, um, Jack Mengtatcha, um, Assistant Professor of History and Religious Studies at the National University of Singapore. Um, Professor Cha's research focuses on Buddhism and Chinese popular religion in Southeast Asia, um, transnational Buddhism and Sino-Southeast Asian interactions. Um, Professor Cha is the author of uh, Monks in Motion, Buddhism and Modernity Across the South China Sea, um, published by Under Oxford, and as well as articles uh, in various um, journals such as Asian Ethnology, um, China Quarterly, Contemporary Buddhism, History of Religions, and um, the Journal of Chinese Religions. Um, Professor Cha's um, topic for today is what is South China Sea Buddhism? Um, so let us welcome Professor Cha. Thank you. Thank you, Chu Hui, for the kind and generous introduction. Dear friends and colleagues, thank you so much for tuning in to my book talk this afternoon. I'm grateful to the University of Sydney's China Studies Center and the Australian Society for Asian Humanities for hosting my talk. I would also like to thank Josh for the invitation and Chu Hui for chairing the session. I'll begin my talk today by looking at the Malay archipelago. The Malay archipelago, oftentimes referred to as Maritime Southeast Asia, consists of Muslim majority Indonesia, Malaysia and Brunei, Catholic Philippines and Chinese Buddhist majority Singapore. In earlier times, this region saw the rise and fall of several Hindu Buddhist kingdoms, followed with the arrival of Islam in the Malay archipelago during the 13th century, leading to large-scale conversion of the population to Islam. By the 20th century, Islam is the religion of approximately 140 million people in Southeast Asia, concentrated in the Malay archipelago. Indonesia, in fact, has the world's largest Muslim population. Singapore, on the other hand, has stood out in the maritime world of Southeast Asia for its Chinese and Buddhist majority population. Buddhism in maritime Southeast Asia during modern times has little or nothing to do with the early Hindu Buddhist kingdoms of Sri Vijaya and Majapahit. The majority of Buddhists in present-day Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore are ethnic Chinese who migrated to Southeast Asia or were born to their immigrant parents in the 19th and 20th centuries. Unknown to many, perhaps, a significant feature in the Chinese migration to maritime Southeast Asia was the dissemination and development of Buddhism in the diaspora. However, the term Southeast Asian Buddhism calls to my Theravada Buddhism, the dominant religion in the mainland Southeast Asian state of Burma, Cambodia, Laos, and Thailand. While Vietnam is considered a part of mainland Southeast Asia, Vietnamese Buddhism, which mostly belongs to the Mahayana tradition, is often regarded as a part of East Asian Buddhism, which is based on the Chinese language canon and is widely practiced in China, Japan, and Korea. In contrast, Maritime Southeast Asia conjures the image of the Malay archipelago consisting of the Muslim majority states of Indonesia, Malaysia, and Brunei, as well as the predominantly Catholic Philippines. Singapore, on the other hand, is deemed as an anomaly because of the predominantly Buddhist and Chinese population. Scholars of Southeast Asia tend to highlight the cultural and historical differences between mainland and maritime Southeast Asia 
by emphasizing the religious contrast between mainland Theravada Buddhism and maritime Islam and Catholicism to conceptualize the religious diversity of Southeast Asia as a region. In doing so, these studies fail to recognize the presence of Buddhism in maritime Southeast Asia and its significance among Chinese communities in the predominantly Islamic and Catholic region. On the other hand, scholars of Buddhism have often limited the study of Southeast Asian Buddhism to the Theravada Buddhist majority on mainland Southeast Asia. For instance, Donna Sherr's seminal work, The Buddhist World of Southeast Asia, as you see over here, focuses only on Theravada Buddhism in Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, and Cambodia, while Anne Hansen's article on modern Buddhism in Southeast Asia recognizes the presence of a vibrant Chinese Buddhist minority in Malaysia at the end of her essay. In other words, previous scholarship has considered the category of Southeast Asian Buddhism to be almost synonymous with Theravada Buddhism. There are three possible reasons to explain the dichotomy between mainland Theravada Buddhism and maritime Islam and Catholicism in the study of Southeast Asia. First, this could be attributed to the historiography of writing nation state histories of Southeast Asia. Scholars of Southeast Asian Buddhism and historians of Southeast Asia generally tend to write the narrative of Southeast Asian countries in the linear fashion from early modern Buddhist kingdoms to modern Buddhist majority nation states. The narrative of the evolution of Buddhist kingdoms neglects the Chinese presence and the connectivity of Buddhist monks across the South China Sea. A second reason could be the form of Buddhism in mainland, uh, sorry, in maritime Southeast Asia. The majority of Buddhists in Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore are ethnic Chinese following Mahayana Buddhism. <clears throat> Therefore, scholars of Buddhism in maritime Southeast Asian states tend to come from a background of Sinology and East Asian Buddhist studies and to consider Chinese Buddhism in Southeast Asia as an extension of Chinese Buddhism rather than as Southeast Asian Buddhism. Additionally, many of them publish their work in Chinese, making them inaccessible to scholars of Southeast Asia who do not read the language. Third, and closely related to the second reason, academic boundaries and institutional limitations create a gap between scholars trained in Southeast Asian Buddhism and in East Asian Buddhism. While students of Southeast Asian Buddhism are linguistically trained in Pali and mainland Southeast Asian languages, students of East Asian Buddhism usually study Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and a modern East Asian research language. For this reason, scholars of Southeast Asian Buddhism are equipped with country-specific linguistic and cultural knowledge under the assumption that they will be studying Theravada Buddhism on the mainland. My book, Monks in Motion, is a study of Chinese Buddhist migration in the 20th century. It also tells the connected history of Buddhist communities in China and maritime Southeast Asia. I've explored the intellectual and institutional history of Buddhism in China and in Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore through the life and career of three prominent monks that we see over here, Zhu Mo, Yan Pei, and Ashin Jarakita. I demonstrate how their education, travels, monastic affiliations, and interactions with the post-colonial nation state have contributed to the emergence of a field of belief and practice that I call South China Sea Buddhism. By South China Sea Buddhism, I refer to the forms of Buddhism in maritime Southeast Asia, which use Mandarin Chinese, Southern Chinese dialects, and Southeast Asian languages in their liturgy and scriptures that emerged out of Buddhist connections across the South China Sea. In coining the term South China Sea Buddhism, I draw Anne Blackburn's work on Indian Ocean Buddhism. In sketching out an intellectual case for Indian Ocean Buddhism, Blackburn emphasizes the connected history of Buddhist communities in South and Southeast Asia. I find the idea of Indian Ocean Buddhism, a term that Blackburn used, to analyze Buddhist mobility and networks across region, helpful to my discussion of monastic migration and networks between China and Southeast Asia. 
Monk's emotion tells the history of monastic and institutional connectivity in the South China Sea during the 20th century, which emerged due to Chinese migration and to larger forces of social political changes that took place in China and in maritime Southeast Asia. My research into South China Sea Buddhism is propelled by three questions. Why did Buddhist monks migrate from China to Southeast Asia? Why did they participate in transregional Buddhist networks across the South China Sea? What were the broader implications of these Buddhist connections? In addition to documenting Zhu Mo, Yan Pei, and Asin Jirakita's ideas, activities, and projects, my book has two aims. First, to present the connected history of Buddhist communities in China and Southeast Asia through synthesizing institutional and intellectual history, as well as local and global history. My focus is how migrant monks acted as agents of knowledge production in the process of selective reformation of Chinese Buddhism through reconfiguring Buddhist ideas through negotiation. Second, to challenge conventional categories of Chinese Buddhism and Southeast Asian Buddhism by focusing on the lesser known, yet no less historically significant Chinese Buddhist communities in maritime Southeast Asia. I demonstrate that Chinese migration contributed to the spread of Buddhism and the establishment of new Buddhist institutions in the diaspora. My talk today is divided into four parts. First, I will explore Chinese migration to maritime Southeast Asia within the 19th and the first half of the 20th century, explaining how the overseas Chinese came to play a significant role in spreading Buddhism from China to the Malay archipelago. Second, I will examine the transnational career of Zhu Mo, examining his activities and rel religious spaces in Malaysia during the second half of the 20th century. Next, I will focus on the case of Yan Pei, reviewing how Singapore's Buddhist history was intertwined with the larger history of migration and the modernization of Chinese Buddhism. Finally, I will discuss Ashin Jiakita's attempt to make Buddhism less Chinese in order to safeguard the survival of Buddhism as a minority religion in Muslim majority Indonesia. Large-scale Chinese migration began in the mid-19th century and lasted through the 1930s. The massive movement of Chinese population could be attributed to both push factors within China and the pull factors in Southeast Asia. Qing China's defeat in the Opium War and the subsequent signing of unequal treaties had significant consequences on the Chinese migration to Southeast Asia. In essence, colonialism in Southeast Asia coupled with the Western opening of China, created the mechanisms for moving Chinese labor from China to Southeast Asia. Chinese migrants were active agents in spreading numerous deity cups into Southeast Asia. For many migrants, the long journey to foreign lands filled them with this sense of anxiety and uncertainty, prompting them to turn towards religious belief and practices, which not only fulfill the spiritual needs of the migrants, but also enhanced their confidence and gave them a greater sense of security in their new work and living environment in colonial Southeast Asia. For instance, the Empress of Heaven, Tian Ho, also known as Ma Zhu, was probably the most popular goddess in the Chinese diaspora, given its popular regard as a protector of seafarers. At the same time, local native place deities such as Guangzhe Zun Wang and Qing Sui Zhu Si that were peculiar and significant to specific dialect groups and locales also accompanied the Chinese migrants to Southeast Asia. The overseas Chinese communities worshipped these deities for a variety of reasons, including others like longevity, fertility, marriage, promotion, and protection. As revealed in a number of sources, overseas, overseas Chinese did not distinguish Buddhist deities from Chinese local gods and they worship these sacred images by lighting candles and incense sticks. Many Chinese migrants venerated the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas along with Taoist deities and practiced the Confucian rites of ancestral worship. This form of pre-institutional Chinese Buddhism with scholars 
called the unity of the three teachings or San Jiao He Yi of Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism was common among the overseas Chinese in Southeast Asia. Furthermore, Chinese merchants, not Buddhist monks, were responsible for running Buddhist temples in the host country prior to the last decade of the 19th century. The early Chinese migrant monks who resided and performed religious ceremonies in the temples were less educated and could barely understand the meaning and significance of the Buddhist scriptures in classical Chinese. The institutional form of Chinese Buddhism only appeared in maritime Southeast Asia during the last decade of the 19th century. By institutional Buddhism, I refer to Buddhism as an organized religion with a system of teachings, rituals, clerics, and organizations. The arrival of educated Chinese monks in the Malay archipelago contributed to the institutionalization of Buddhism and the subsequent monastery building efforts among the overseas Chinese communities. Moreover, unlike their predecessors who were primarily ritual specialists, this new breed of migrant monks who received their monastic trainings in China were concerned with the dissemination of Buddhist doctrines to the overseas Chinese. Within the second half of the 19th and the first half of the 20th centuries, social political changes in China gave rise to a Buddhist modernist movement, which in turn contributed to the making of vibrant South China Sea Buddhist networks. In a nutshell, the Buddhist modernist movement in China during the early half of the 20th century was characterized by reform of the leadership system uh, in the Buddhist monastery, founding of Buddhist research institutions as well as lay and women organizations, publishing of Buddhist periodicals, printing and distribution of free Dharma books, um, as an opening of Buddhist libraries, setting up of Buddhist academies, and a promotion of Buddhist charitable activities. These Buddhist migrant monks participated in the form of modernist projects as defined by Anne Hanser and David McMahon, making claims of the relevance of Buddhist doctrines to the issues of the time and promoted Buddhism based on national particularity. Tai Chi was one of the most prominent figures among the Chinese Buddhist modernists during the Republican period. Born in 1890 in the Chongde County of Zhejiang Province, he became a novice in Jiangsu and received his higher ordination at the Tiantong Monastery in Ningbo. After the founding of the Republic, Tai Chi spearheaded the Buddhist revival movement of Fu Jiao Fu Xing Yun Dong and advocated for the need to reform the monastic system and promote education. He advocated human life Buddhism or Ren Shen Fu Jiao to revitalize Chinese Buddhism. His ideas of, humanist, of human life Buddhism were aimed at changing the existing image and understanding of Buddhism as a religion for the day to emphasize the practice of Buddhism for this worldly life, addressing the social and spiritual issues of 20th century China. Under the abbacy of Tai Chi, Nanputo Monastery became a headquarters for the Buddhist modernist movement in Southeast China, and it was a key nodal point in the networks connecting modernist monks in South China and the overseas Chinese in Southeast Asia. The South China Sea Buddhist networks were crucial in the transregional circulation of people, ideas, and resources between China and Southeast Asia. The religious connections, on the one hand, facilitated the movement of Buddhist monks from China to Southeast Asia and fostered the dissemination of Buddhist modernist ideas to the overseas Chinese communities. On the other hand, these networks uh, were used to transfer resources from Southeast Asia to fund religious activities in China. For instance, as the abbot of the Namputo Monastery, Tai Chi made three visits to Singapore in 1926, 1928, and 1940 to leverage on the South China Sea networks to seek donations from overseas Chinese to raise funds for his, rev for his renovation plans for the Namputo Monastery, as well as to fund his education project at the Mingnan Buddhist Institute of Mingnan Fo Shiren. During his first visit in 1926, Tai Chi met with several prominent Chinese businessmen and became friends with Dan Kaki and Albun Ho. 
Tai Chi's friendship with this influential local Chinese leader demonstrates the significance of the transregional South China Sea network, allowing him to seek financial support from wealthy business elites in the diaspora and opportunities to preach his ideas of human life Buddhism to them. The arrival of modernist Buddhist ideas further contributed to the institutionalization of Chinese Buddhism in maritime Southeast Asia during the first half of the 20th, 20th century. Tai Chi had ambitious, ambitious plans to spread his ideas of human life Buddhism beyond China and wanted to organize an ecumenical Buddhist movement to extend the reach of his modernist movement. In September 1926, Tai Chi came to Singapore and gave a series of talks at the Victoria Memorial Hall, which attracted a large crowd of overseas Chinese. As most of the Buddhist monasteries in Singapore during the early 20th, 20th century were disconnected from the laity, Tai Chi suggested that, that the establishment of a lay Buddhist association would be beneficial in propagating the Dhamma to the overseas Chinese communities. This proposal inspired Ning Da Yin, a prominent Buddhist householder who founded the Chinese Buddhist Association with assistance from Zhuan Da a year later in 1927. The Chinese Buddhist Association became an important institution for the promotion of Buddhist modernist movement in Singapore by providing education and welfare services for the overseas Chinese communities. By the turn of the 20th century, the development of institutional Buddhism in maritime Southeast Asia was linked to and enabled by broader events in China. By the end of the 1940s, there was a larger presence of Buddhist organization in maritime Southeast Asia. We will now look at the development of Buddhism in the region and the ways in which two more Yenpei and Asin Jirakita promoted their respective forms of Buddhist modernism in the Chinese diaspora. Today, many Malaysian Buddhists consider Zumo to be the father of Malaysia's Chinese Buddhism. In 1913, Chen De'an, who would become Zumo, was born near the foot of Mount Yantan in the Lecheng County of Zhejiang Province. He became a monk when he was 12 and later enrolled at the Mingnan Buddhist Institute in Xiamen, where he became a student of Tai Chi. Following the Communist Party's victory and the establishment of the People's Republic of China in 1949, many Chinese monks feared communist hostility towards religion and hence decided to leave mainland China. Zumo first left for Macau, which was under Portuguese rule, to become the founding advisor of the Macau Buddhist Society. In 1954, he migrated to Penang and remained in Malaysia until his death in 2002. During his five decade religious career in Malaysia, he served as an advisor of the Porte School of Puti Xueyuan, founded and served as the inaugural president of the Malaysian Buddhist Association, established the Triple Wisdom Hall, San Hui Jiang Tang, and started the Malaysian Buddhist Institute in Malaysia Fo uh, Xueyuan. In 1998, Zhu Mo became the first Buddhist monk in Malaysia to receive the title Datu from the head of state of Penang for his contributions to Buddhism and education in Malaysia. Zumo redefined the basis of being Buddhist in Malaysia by drawing on Tai Chi's modernist ideas of human life Buddhism. He encouraged intra-religious conversion by advocating a Malaysian Chinese Buddhist identity that emphasized this worldly practice of Buddhism, promoted a vision of Buddhist orthodoxy or Zhenxing Fu Jiao, and established new Buddhist institutions for the promotion of Buddhist education. By examining the Malaysian context with the idea of South China Sea Buddhism in mind, we are able to see the connected history of Buddhist communities in China and Southeast Asia. Chinese Buddhist migration has contributed to a redefinition of the concept of being Buddhist in Malaysia and created a Malaysian Chinese Buddhist identity based on the ideas of human life Buddhism. When Zhu Mo first migrated to Penang, the mix of the majority of Malaysian Chinese knew little about Buddhist doctrine and practiced a mix of Buddhism, Taoism, and Chinese popular religious practices. Furthermore, Buddhism was commonly associated with death 
and funeral rites. Zumo advocated a national Buddhist identity based on the principle of human life Buddhism, stressing the importance to incorporate Buddhism into one's life, practice orthodox Buddhism, and take refuge in the Triple Gems. In other words, he wanted to invent a new definition of being Buddhist for the Malaysian Buddhist community. To promote Buddhist education, Zumo contributed to the expansion of the Porte School and established the Malaysian Buddhist Association, Triple Wisdom Hall, and Malaysian Buddhist Institute, which were crucial in disseminating doctrinal knowledge and facilitating intra-religious conversion among the Buddhist community in Malaysia. Next, we will take a look at Yen Pei. Singaporean Buddhists generally remember Yen Pei as a scholar, social worker, monk responsible for bringing the ideas of humanistic Buddhism to Southeast Asia and promoting them in his lectures, writings, and social activism. Most of his writings were published in a 34 volume collection entitled Collected Works of Mindful Observation and a 12 volume sequel entitled A Sequel to the Mindful Observation making him the most prolific Chinese Buddhist writers of the period in Southeast Asia. Yen Pei was born in 1917 in a poor farming uh, family in Yangzhou city in Jiangsu province. In 1929, he was ordained as a monk. Yen Pei was very much a product of the Buddhist modernist movement in Republican China that I talked about earlier. Like many of his contemporaries, such as Zhu Mo, Yen Pei received formal monastic training at Buddhist seminaries where he was influenced by Tai Chi's vision of human life Buddhism and Ying Sun's idea of humanistic Buddhism or Ren Jian Fu Jiao. Following the communist victory and the establishment of the PRC in 1949, Yen Pei left China for Hong Kong and later settled in Taiwan with his friend and teacher Ying Sun. During Yen Pei's decade-long career in Taiwan before, between 1952 and 1964, he made three trips to Southeast Asia in 1958, 1961, and 1964, where he contributed to the conversations between Theravada and Mahayana Buddhist monastics and established connections with the Southeast Asian Buddhist communities. Yen Pei initially wanted to migrate and spread Buddhism in Vietnam but was unable to do so because of the Vietnam War. In 1964, he came to Singapore and spent the remaining 32 years of his life building a Buddhist community in post-colonial Singapore. His religious career in Singapore can be divided into two phases. The first, as the abbot of the Ling Fung Prashna Auditorium from 1964 to 1979, and subsequently as a social activist and founding chairman of the Singapore Buddhist Welfare Services from 1980 to his death in 1996. During the first phase of his career as the abbot of Ling Fung Prashna Auditorium, Yen Pei was concerned with the lack of Dharma activities in Singapore. He built a modern auditorium and pioneered activities such as weekly Dharma lectures, group practices, and Sunday school, which were uncommon among the Buddhist organizations in Singapore during that time. Yen Pei also relied on his networks to make his auditorium a nodal point in the global Buddhist networks, thus allowing him to invite monks from Asia, Australia, and North America to visit and speak to his congregation. The publication and circulation of his collected works of mindful observation earned him the reputation as one of the preeminent scholar monks of Chinese Buddhism in the region. In the second phase of his religious career, Yen Pei became a social activist and founded the Singapore Buddhist Welfare Services. He was actively engaged with secular social issues that were of concern in Singapore society. Yen Pei's Buddhist welfare services play an important role in promoting elder care and filial piety, organ donation and kidney dialysis, and drug prevention and rehabilitation against the backdrop of a rapidly developing Singapore. Yen Pei preached Buddhist doctrines to not only justify the need for Singaporean Buddhists to be socially relevant and contribute to social welfare, but also went so far 
as to say that Buddhist teachings could be used as practical solutions to addressing national issues. The Singapore, Buddha, the Singapore government awarded Yen Pei the Public Service Medal in 1986 and the Public Service Star in 1992 to recognize his contributions to social welfare and medical services. Now let us turn our attention to Ashing Jarakita. Widely regarded as the first Indonesian-born Buddhist monk, Asin Jirakita took it as his mission to propagate Buddhism in the archipelago nation. His Buddhayana movement, which combined the doctrines and practices of Mahayana and Theravada Buddhism, established an inclusive and non-sectarian Buddhist community in Indonesia. Asin Jirakita wanted to craft a vision of Indonesian Buddhism, or Agama Buddha Indonesia, as a diverse yet unified religion in line with the motto of unity in diversity of the modern Indonesian nation. Later, he introduced the controversial concept of Sangya Apit Buddha to make Buddhism compatible with the first principle of the Panchan Sila, the five philosophical pillars of Indonesia during the New Order period. Asin Jirakita was born in 1923 in Bogor, a city in West Java, at the time part of the Dutch colony of the East Indies. He was given the name Tibo An by his Chinese immigrant parents. His early exposure to Buddhism at Chinese temples of Klanteng was primarily through chanting and, very, and vegetarianism. Unlike Zhu Mo and Yan Pei who were born in China, Ashin Jirakita was a Peranakan Chinese born and raised in the Dutch East Indies. He was educated in the Dutch colonial education system and later studied chemistry in the Netherlands. In 1953, Tibo An was ordained as a novice at Gong Hok Si or Guang Hua Si by Ben Qing, where he was given the Dharma name Ti Zheng. After several months of monastic training, Ti Zheng uh, decided to seek higher ordination to become a bhikkhu. The lack of the required number of monks for the transmission of precepts, however, made it impossible for him to be fully ordained in Indonesia. Therefore, Tizhen planned to seek higher ordination in the Chinese Mahayana tradition in mainland China, but was unable to do so as religious activities were restricted under the communist regime in the PRC. Consequently, Tizhen was reordained and received his higher ordination in the Theravada tradition under Mahasi Sayadaw in Burma, who gave him the name Jinarakita. Unlike his contemporaries in Malaysia and Singapore, who sought to spread ideas of Buddhist modernism among the Chinese community, Asin Jinarakita tried to make Buddhism less Chinese as a calculated strategy to ensure the survival of Buddhism as a minority religion in the world's largest Muslim nation. He founded the Buddhayana movement that promoted non-sectarian doctrines and practices to be in line with the national discourse of unity in diversity. The Buddhayana movement conceptualized Buddhism as a religion within three concentric circles that we see over here. The innermost circle is the core teaching, which he claimed uh, is the liberal which is the liberating dimension of Buddhism. The next circle is the method, which is varied according to the personal capacity and karmic circumstances of the practitioner. Finally, the outermost circle is culture, which makes one form of Buddhism seemingly different from another. In terms of practice, Asin Jirakita encouraged a non-sectarian mixing of Buddhist doctrines and liturgical practices. He preached that Buddhists should not be fixated on a single sectarian practice and should not consider another approach to be wrong and inferior. On a personal level, Asin Jirakita kept the Theravada precepts of not handling money and not eating after midday, and he maintained the Mahayana practice of vegetarianism. According to my interviewees, he did so to bridge the Vinaya practices of both traditions. Later in the 1980s, he grew a beard to look like a Mahayana elder monk, but continued to dress in Theravada robes. From his personal practice and his appearance, it was evident that Asin Jirakita wanted to stress that he was neither a Theravada nor a Mahayana monk, but a combination of both. 
Following the, September, the 30th of September movement in 1965, Suharto became president and ushered in 31 years of authoritarian rule known as the New Order that lasted until his resignation in 1998. Suharto's government blamed Communist China for the 30th of September movement and for its influence over the Indonesian Communist Party and decided to cut diplomatic ties with the PRC in 1967. The government passed a series of laws and presidential orders to assimilation aimed at Chinese Indonesians and emphasized the Banchan Silat principle of belief in the one almighty God, using religion as a force to counter Edi's communist influence. To make Buddhism compatible with the first principle of Banchan Silat, Asin Jakita introduced the concept of Sangya Apit Buddha as the Buddhist version of an almighty God. He claimed that the concept of Sanghyang Api Buddha could be found in the Sanghyang Kama Hayamikan, a 10th century text produced during the reign of King Sindok from East Java. Following Ashin Jirakita's rediscovery of Sanghyang Api Buddha from ancient Javanese texts, he mobilized his disciples from various parts of Indonesia to spread these ideas. However, Sanghyang Api Buddha was a double aged sword for Ashin Jirakita and his Buddhayana movement. On the one hand, the concept was accepted by Suharto's government, thus ensuring that Buddhism continued to be one of the recognized religions in Indonesia during the New Order period. On the other hand, some of Ashin Jirakita's followers became crucial of his theistic explanation of Buddhism and broke away from the Buddhayana movement. In Monk's emotion, I've explored the ideas uh, of Buddhist migrations, settlement, integration and networks in the 20th century through two main themes. The first concerns the attempt to write a connected history of Buddhist communities in China and Southeast Asia. The other explores the role of Chinese migrant monks in the making of Buddhist modernism in maritime Southeast Asian states of Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore. I conclude here with some directions for future research in hope that other more linguistically endowed scholars will pursue further studies on the connected history of Buddhist communities in China, Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, and mainland and maritime Southeast Asia. In the first place, the evidence of Chinese Mahayana and Southeast Asian Theravada Buddhist connections discussed in my book reveals that Chinese and Chinese diasporic monks were interested in going to mainland Southeast Asia to exchange ideas and learn from the Pali oriented colleagues during the 20th century. That is, the South China Sea Buddhist networks linking the Chinese monks to maritime Southeast Asia have also kept the Chinese Buddhists of Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore in touch with Buddhist institutions and monastics in Burma, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam. There remains much to learn about the patterns of Buddhist circulations in the South China Sea and the ways in which modernist Buddhist ideas overlap with and perhaps facilitated one another. Another area deserving further attention is the relations between modernist Buddhists and pre-institutional Buddhist temples in maritime Southeast Asia. As we have learned from the case study of the three prominent South China Sea monks, modernist Buddhists attempted to promote their visions of religious orthodoxy by setting themselves apart from pre-institutional Buddhist practices. There were Chinese Buddhists who participated and moved freely between modernist and pre-institutional Buddhist organizations without having to give up one over the other. Overlapping commercial, clan, and religious ties among the Chinese diasporic communities in maritime Southeast Asia may have made it difficult if not impossible to have a clear cut separation between modernist monks and pre-institutional Buddhist groups. What, how did their collaboration or conflict impact the religious landscape in maritime Southeast Asia? And that's the question that's really worth asking. Finally, for the time period considered in my book, Chinese Buddhists fled communist China and supported anti-communist initiative in Taiwan and maritime Southeast Asia. Some recent and forthcoming works have revealed that Buddhists became employed, uh, employed in the Cold War politics of mainland Southeast Asia. 
Yet little attention has been paid to the ways in which Chinese monks participated in counter-communist activities or how they relied on South China Sea Buddhist networks to cultivate activist ties and collaborate with state actors and like-minded Buddhists during the Cold War. Examination of the writings of Chinese monks in maritime Southeast Asia, along with Burmese, Khmer, Lao, Thai, and Vietnamese sources from the mainland could help us construct a more comprehensive picture of East and Southeast Asian Buddhism during the Cold War period. It's likely that a further unpacking of the connected history of the Buddhist communities in the region will help us better understand the flow of people, idea, and resources that shape South China Sea Buddhism. And I will stop here. Thank you.